village of Hemsby near Great Yarmouth were evacuated at the weekend amid fears they could be washed into the north. The coastal community for coastal erosion. The Norfolk cliffs collapsing at an alarming rate. ...into the sea, one of 13 chalets abandoned by their owners after a weekend of severe storms eroded the sandy cliffs at Hemsby. Sea levels are going to continue to threaten our coastlines with difficult decisions already being made about which communities are deemed worthy of saving and which will be relocated or abandoned. East Anglia during the medieval period was one of the richest and most densely populated areas in all of Britain. Covering an area of approximately Norfolk, Suffolk and Cambridgeshire, East Anglia originally gained its riches from mining and trading black flint, a much sought after construction and tool making material, and later for wool trade. The wool from this area was in heavy demand, and due to the landscape being rather flat and full of rivers, this countryside was a perfect breeding ground for sheep, so more and more people flocked to East Anglia to settle. The name East Anglia, coming from the Angles who came overseas from mainland Europe to settle in the east of England. Even before the Norman invasion, East Anglia had already established itself as a thriving Saxon trading hub and religious centre, having built many early cathedrals such as Kings Lynn Minster, North Elmham, and its southern counterpart, South Elmham. The invading Normans came to East Anglia in 1066, and were met with many ports dotted all along the North Sea coast, either defended by rivers, wares, earth ditches, or a mixture of all three. After recording the revenues from all these ports and neighbouring farmsteads in the Doomsday Book, the Normans saw how much potential this area had. Therefore, they invested vast sums of money into East Anglia, building many more churches, improving the defences, and enlarging the ports along the east coast. By the 13th century, East Anglia was now at the height of its power and influence. The rich ports of Great Yarmouth, Walberswick, Covehithe, Blytheborough, Dunwich, Orford, and many more were in full force trading overseas with various countries such as Sweden, Denmark, Finland, Belgium, Netherlands, France and Spain. These ports had associated towns which used their riches to build bigger and better defences, for example the giant stone walls of Great Yarmouth. However, the largest chunk of income was spent on the construction of great religious sites such as friaries, priories, abbeys and many, many ornate churches. In fact, the 13th century saw the highest concentration of functioning churches in all of East Anglia, which in turn persuaded more people to come settle in the area from all over the country. Rich lords, probably getting their riches from owning the trading ships and lucrative farmsteads, built their giant medieval halls in East Anglia, and in turn funded for construction for more churches on their land as an offering to the local people of the countryside. East Anglia was at the heart of medieval England, and while various other areas around the kingdom were experiencing friction, such as the Scottish border, the Welsh border, and the war between England and France down south, East Anglia was left in relative peace and harmony, to continue with farming, trade, and religious practices. By this time also becoming the centre for illumination and writing, thanks to the high numbers of well-educated monks, priests and canons living and working around the various churches, priories and abbeys all over East Anglia. The realm of East Anglia was the strongest it had ever been. A superpower of Europe, Dunwich being the apple in the eye of this vast and rich trading centre. Nothing could put a stop to this driving force, or this, at least, was what the medieval people of the 13th century in East Anglia believed. Hidden under the waves, something was stirring, something bigger than anyone could imagine. The world was changing, destined to spell doom for an entire realm of people. 
affecting every person and turning their lives upside down forevermore. This underwater monster was the North Sea Current. Turning the clock back some 10,000 years, the coast of East Anglia was indeed no coast at all, but was part of a large landmass connecting Britain to Scandinavia, called Doggerland. During a cataclysmic event around 8,000 years ago, known as the Storega Slide, a giant chunk of glacial ice broke away from western Scandinavia during the Great Fall, which caused a monolithic tsunami, engulfing the entirety of low-lying Doggerland, as well as washing over Britain, leaving devastation to the indigenous people, flora and fauna. As the seas settled, only a part of Doggerland survived as an island in the North Sea, and with rising sea levels, this island was, as well, succumbed by the sea. This left East Anglia as a newfound coastal region in Britain, with cliffs made from chalk, flint, and silty sands overlooking a very shallow sea. The coastline of East Anglia was to change extensively over the next 7,000 years, mainly due to its population of the area artificially building new farmland, with giant irrigation projects to reclaim land, which shapes the coastline largely to how we see it today. Although one thing that the people of medieval England couldn't have foreseen were the effects of longshore drift. Longshore drift is a geographical term for the movement of material caused by waves and ocean currents along a coastline. These waves approach the beach at an angle, but due to the gradient of the land going into the water, recede directly from the beach. The act of waves moving sediment further down a coastline constantly, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, meant that over time, great volumes of sand was being displaced across the East Anglian coast, which was bad news for the people living there. Ports generally take advantage of river estuaries which funnel out into the sea. The middle of the rivers tend to be deep enough and, in some cases, are engineered by man to become deeper to bear the type of ships desired to use the body of water. The unfortunate outcome of longshore drift meant that currents were constantly displacing sediment into these busy medieval ports, constantly causing the ports to sill up and beach the ships that are using them. This played havoc for the local population using these ports and harbours, and caused multiple towns to become abandoned and rebuilt further down the coast. This, of course, heavily disrupted the efficiency of trade and, in some cases, caused all trade to cease for extended periods of time. By the mid-14th century, many once bustling ports and trading harbours such as Walluswick, Covehife and Orford had now all silted up to the point where the locals were forced to abandon the towns and move elsewhere. The trade rights ceased and the income was lost with nothing substantial to replace it. But Mother Nature wasn't done with the doomed coastline of East Anglia just yet. Coupled with the devastation of longshore drift, another cataclysmic effect of the sea was taking place, which proved to be the final blow for East Anglia's thriving coastal trading hubs. The sea had been battering the soft cliffs for centuries, and with each winter storm, more and more of the Norfolk and Suffolk cliffside were pummeled by the aggressive waves, tumbling into the sea and being swept away by the effects of longshore drift. This coastal erosion was happening so quickly, in fact, that entire medieval towns were falling into the sea, something which is still happening today in places like Haysborough, Covehife and Sidestrand. Although almost every coastal settlement across East Anglia is continuing to feel the effects of coastal erosion to this day. In some places, the coastline is receding by almost 5 metres per year, and the sea has already swallowed up many once bustling medieval towns such as Shipton, which was situated just north of Cromer in the 14th century, but is now all underwater. However, the most devastating story is of that of Dunwich, the great medieval city which was once one of the most rich and influential ports in all of Europe. First becoming important in the Anglo-Saxon period, Dunwich was the capital of the East Anglian Kingdom, being tied with its sister city further inland, Norwich. 
By the 14th century, this international port had grown in size to that of London, becoming increasingly rich and spending its fortune on multiple grand churches, including the Friary of Dunwich, which is one of the only medieval buildings of the city which survives to this day. The first signs of Dunwich's apocalypse were in the years of 1286 and 1287, where three massive storm surges wrecked havoc along the entire southern and eastern English coastline, causing considerable damage to Dunwich for aggressive waves and extensive flooding. The storms caused great chunks of cliff to fall into the sea, with the sediment being displaced throughout the longshore drift which sealed up the ports and rendered them useless. Over the century that followed, further storms battered the East Anglian coastline, with more and more sediments of cliff crashing into the sea, ripping apart the medieval city of Dunwich house by house, road by road, with incredible speed. By the mid-14th century, the city was forced to be abandoned, with only the remaining people being the residents of Greyfriars Friary, and a few farmers living on the westernmost side of Dunwich. Up until the 16th century, the friars witnessed the entire city fall into the sea piece by piece, taking each neighbouring parish church down into the murky depths, until they too were forced to abandon their cherished home due to the decree of King Henry VIII and the dissolution of the monasteries in England. The neighbouring town of Blytheborough also had its local priory ripped away due to the dissolution of the monasteries, and a document recording the inventory of the priory by the late 1530s told of the sorry state of the medieval religious centres in East Anglia by this time telling a depressing tale of broken pots, patched up barns, old feeble horses for ploughing, broken carts and barely anything of value left in the church name. The power of the sea had truly destroyed medieval East Anglia, and torn the region out of the books of history forevermore. The life of East Anglia as a superpower of Europe, coming to a swift and depressing end by the middle of the 16th century. In 1922, all Saints Church of Dunwich was the last of the parish churches to be claimed by the sea, and alas, marked the final blow for the medieval city which once was so full of life and splendour. Today you can still visit the western side of Dunwich, and see the ruinous remains of a Franciscan friary of Greyfriars, as well as the Church of St James, which in itself has a few very interesting features as the church is actually Victorian, but built to look like a classic 13th century medieval church which would have stood within the city of Dunwich. In the courtyard are located two ancient ruins of the Middle Ages. A large buttress standing like a column is actually the reclaimed section of tower from All Saints Church before the rest of the church unfortunately fell into the sea, as well as the ruins of a former leper hospital. Today, Dunwich has largely been forgotten by time, but an episode of Time Team helped shed some light into just how extensive the city used to be and helped reignite an interest in the site. Unfortunately, sea defences would be impossible to erect to protect this site due to the sheer length of coastline required to defend against the waves and the cost this would entail. As such, there are no plans to protect the coastline from further erosion and it is estimated that by 2070, the medieval friary, along with the nearby Grand Church of Covehife, will also no longer exist, doomed to fall into the sea along with the earth that it's built on.